Hello and welcome to episode 59 of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. This is the show for anyone who works in fundraising and who wants ideas and a dose of encouragement to help them enjoy their job and raise more money, especially during these chaotic times. And today, if you work for a hospice or any other small charity, or if you work in events or community or corporate fundraising, I hope you're going to find this episode really interesting because today I'm sharing an interview I conducted with a fabulous fundraiser named Paul Courtney, who's director of fundraising at Children's Hospice Southwest. Paul and I have created a new series of training films, which is completely free and is called Hospice Fundraising Growth Strategies Now and After the Pandemic. As I say, the films are free and whether you work for a hospice or not, you can get your copy from the episode notes to this podcast, which are on my website. And my website is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. So if you're interested, look on the podcast section of that website for the notes for episode 59. And you'll be able to click on the link and get hold of this series of five short films in which Paul and I unpack strategies to help you raise funds through events, through corporates, through individual giving and more during and after the pandemic. So I hope you enjoy today's episode in and of itself. And if you do, please do go out and also check out those free training films where we delve deeper. I always leave my conversations with Paul feeling more energised and more optimistic. And this time was no different. I really hope you find it helpful too. Paul, Courtney, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Rob. You? Yes, extremely well, thank you. And thanks so much for making time for a interview to do with fundraising and leadership in these strange times you uh, the other day uh, helped me make a really interesting set of films for uh, particularly for hospice fundraisers but frankly for, for any fundraiser i think will find them useful because your team have achieved some really wonderful things i mean I know lots of charities have achieved some wonderful things but the results that children's hospice southwest have achieved during the last 10, 11 months of the pandemic really do stand out even more than lots of the other success stories I've studied Um, to the extent that broadly speaking in this very tough year, you're on course to pretty much achieve the same budget you were predicted to raise before the pandemic even hit. And that is really considering the portfolio of fundraising income that your hospice and most hospices tend to have and the way in many charities that's been really hit in terms of community and events type fundraising. It's a huge achievement. Congratulations to you and to everyone involved and all the hard, hard work that's been involved. In that other set of films, you explain some particular tactics for how that has been achieved, for instance, in corporate and individual giving um, and uh, events income even. Uh, I gather your centre run, if I'm remembering rightly, raised around £100,000, which is similar to, or even a bit more ultimately, in, in terms of the ratio, than you than it would have raised the year before. So uh, in this podcast version of the interview, could you just start off, for instance, with the kernel of the idea for how you managed to get sponsored event type income, even in this difficult year, given that many charities have understandably struggled with that? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's been a year of what everybody talks about as pivoting, doesn't it? Event, virtual event pivots, a word that probably many of us never want to hear again. Um, but it's something that we've all had to do. And and like you say, the the big mass of participation events that were a really key part of our calendar every single year, um, our rainbow runs that happened every June, and our Santa's on the run events that happen in December. We we moved both of those in in June very quickly. In December, obviously, we had a bit more time to plan, which was fabulous. But but the real change to them was about putting the event participants or the supporters right at the heart of that journey and those events. Um, and and I suppose it's that stewardship thread that is just so important. We stopped immediately thinking about them as events. We stopped, we got ourselves out of that event mindset and we started looking at them as stewardship activities that really gave and delivered brilliant experiences for supporters. Um, And what we found as we did that was that we were giving supporters, we were giving the general public, people that we'd never had contact with before, 
the opportunity to do things in their own terms. So just simple changes like um, running these virtual activities over the space of a weekend rather than on a specific day gave people freedom. You know, for many years, our Santas on the Run events physically were held in three different locations across the region on the same day. Now, I don't know what your diary is normally like in uh, December, but you know, chances are that that date was the date that it was the children's primary school Christmas fair or that something else was on. So for, for a huge group of people, immediately the decision was made whether they took part or not. Um, so by doing it across that weekend, we were able to provide this brilliant freedom for, for people to do their own thing whenever they wanted, um, which worked for us too. You know, as a family, we went out just before Christmas at seven o'clock on the Sunday morning of the Santa's on the Run Goes Freestyle event and did our 5K dressed as penguins and reindeers and goodness knows what else, um, because that was the time that worked for us. Um, so just giving the supporters that chance to do what they want, when they wanted, under the banner of this wider sense of community and being part of something bigger was hugely successful. And I think that was the other element that really, really worked for both of the events. What we learned a lot of back in June with Rainbows and what we brought forward through into Santa's in December was about really creating that buzz of community online. So really creating uh, communities of support, groups and event pages, and really driving content to those, not by ourselves, but by participants. So much so that my Facebook feed over the Santa's weekend was just a wash with hundreds of people posting their pictures, engaging, and of course us as the charity reacting, commenting, cheering along to every single one of them, which um, pretty much destroyed my social media team, but <laughs> did an incredible thing because every single one, in, in June we had just over a thousand taking part in the rainbow run in December, we had probably on the way to 1,100, 1,200 people taking part. Every single one of those that posted anything at any point got a like, got a comment, got a cheer. And, and just something so simple, <laughs> but on a huge volume, was brilliant in terms of that stewardship because I feel seen, I feel noticed, I feel encouraged. Um, and I feel like when it comes to the next event, I'll do it again. And I think that's a really important thing just on, on, on these virtual events is that there's been a lot of talk and there's still a lot of talk, isn't there? Particularly in, you know, the, the dull quiet bit of the year that we find ourselves now um, that people will get virtual event fatigue. Um, and I just don't believe that's a thing. You know, why would I as a donor or a supporter get fatigued by brilliant stewardship, brilliant thanking, and brilliant engagement. And finally, brilliant contact with what my fundraising is going to achieve in the life of children and families. Not, I, I could listen to that for years. <laughs> yeah, and in that other film you made with me, you, you were telling just how unbelievably hard your team have worked at making time in the day for the really important stuff, not the yeah. spreadsheets, but the picking up of the phone to anyone who said they're going to do one of these things for your hospice, bravely or not bravely, picking up the phone and just saying hello and this is amazing and I saw your post on Facebook and you know, yeah. thank you so much. And you know, this is such obvious stuff. And yet in many charities across the land, we can understand if there's lots of other things on the to-do list, which we just think will get done first, which seems a bit less scary, but you're just saying you, you knew from the start that the engine room of people actually following, following through, doing the thing, enjoying it, and then indeed telling their friends and then indeed collecting the sponsorship, it just makes a huge difference if if they've heard from you and you're impressed and delighted and grateful and can give them a sense of the difference it's making. Absolutely. It makes such a difference. And, you know, my wonderful team in the week running up to Rainbows and in the run up to Santa's made 
literally hundreds and hundreds of calls. Yeah, the Rainbow, I think they I think they did just shy of a thousand calls and emails in the four or five days in the run up. Um, and and you know, there were various responses to that. The first one always was surprise. <laughs> from the donor and that's always concerning isn't it that our first response from donors in the general public is surprised that a charity is ringing to encourage them and say yay you're great and um, we want to change that culture um but but the the second was that sense of oh that's really great oh thanks so much for calling um but the third i think most important impact for me was that as fundraisers did that more and more so that impact started to happen in them as well because we know don't we as humans talking to people and encouraging people does something positive for us too um and and for fundraisers to either start their day or break up their day or end their day with one of those sorts of calls and interactions releases all the right sort of endorphins um and reminds us why we do what we do as fundraisers yeah uh and Anyway, all human beings have had a need for some level of connection with others, and some people need more than others. Uh, but now more than ever, one of the big battles we have to fight individually and for and with our teams is that battle against the disconnect, against a sense yeah. of isolation, because that human need for connection is not met. And yeah, if one as personally or as a leader is creating a culture in which you're encouraging people to make time to reach out and do a good yeah. thing for someone who cares about your cause it may take a little courage to get started but once like you said on our film once you get started it, my goodness it yeah. releases those feel good hormones and they're likely to be more upbeat for the rest of the day and therefore do other creative or brave fundraising moves for the rest yeah. of the day definitely uh, it emboldens doesn't it totally it does uh goodness I'd, I'd like to dip into detail in all these topics but sadly in the in the podcast version of this interview there, there won't be time but you know th there is a connection between where your first point which is just think a bit about think of the fundraising opportunity now as the chance to do the best stewardship we've ever done and really i think that's at the heart of why even in this unbelievably tough arena of fundraising which is working with corporates right now even in that field your team have done surprisingly well and again we're not going to go do it all the tactics but a centerpiece of your strategy there has been to, to regularly put on events not to ask for money and raise money but to put on a virtual uh, breakfast event for companies who are already supporting or might be interested in supporting could you top line tell us about that strategy how often were were those events are those events and any two or three elements of the recipe for how they're they're structured yeah of course so very early on we established our bite-sized business breakfast we always have had business breakfast in our hospice sites but obviously we can't do that um so we just straight to zoom um and we began to do the monthly and um, and we began to just create this pattern um simple sessions hour long no more um with a, a simple topic often around well-being or um different companies and their involvement um like you say not asking for donations and we started the first couple and we put them at 10 pounds for people to sign up still if you you know we had some good numbers but very quickly we changed that we learned we said no let's just make them free this is not about income generation this is about engagement and stewardship um and the simple formula was simply to provide space for people to chat, like you say, existing supporters or new, um, and share stories. And that was the most powerful bit of the formula, is that on every single one of these occasions, we had a member of our care teams or a family that we supported um, joining us on screen. And we got out of the way and they just shared what it meant to be supported by Children's Hospice Southwest. Um, um, for, the, for our care staff that shared, it was wonderful to see them without scripting and without briefing, personally, eye to eye, saying thank you so much for the support that you give because it gives me the privilege of being able to be there with families. And, and I mean, that's just beautiful because it's 
absolute direct stewardship. And and it just created a great forum. And and in the end, what, what tended to happen with these monthly events was that as people were given the chance to introduce themselves to talk about their businesses, nine times out of 10, when we encouraged people to introduce themselves, what they did was tell everyone else about the way they were fundraising for children's hospice. And it, it became a bit of a competition <laughs> through the intros, um, which it was fantastic because they were saying how it had engaged their staff. They were saying how it was improving everybody's morale. They were saying how their company was a better place to work as a result of their fundraising for Children's Hospice Southwest, which they, they were doing our job for us. It was great. Yeah, and of, of course, that's the, the best kind of... Uh... Uh, encouragement or information to help other companies who are wondering whether to commit and find the time and energy to do something else if they're hearing other companies a bit like theirs saying that com completely sincerely unprompted you know that's a whole different thing from looking at a charity's corporate fundraising web page talking yeah. about the transactional benefits to employee morale if you get involved it's just a whole different level isn't it and uh, yeah. one of my favorite uh, elements you, you told me I mean th there have been so many moments but there was a particular moment after a, a, a father of a little boy who had been supported and in the your team had supported him all the way through and he explained and the little boy I think had died last autumn he, he, yes he died in the autumn but the the, the the crux of it was saying that he he and his his partner he just wasn't sure how they would have survived at all without the help the help of the hospice supporting through every step of that difficult journey and the bit of the story i i then even resonated just as much for me is of uh, a managing director of a company who is on that uh breakfast club event you know clearly emotional saying we we started out well until this morning i thought we were just doing a charity of the year but now it's really clear to me, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're in it for the long haul. And in that moment, it's abundantly clear just what an amazing difference it makes if a charity yeah. can do the it is you know, extra work to arrange for these um, people who have benefited to be looked after in the right way and invited and in the right way to see whether they'd be willing to come and share their story. Lots of that is is not easy and we're right to be cautious about doing it really properly and caringly respectfully but when a charity can go those extra steps to create that for a company to go from potentially raising this much to enthusiastically being proud to raise ever more yeah. in that moment we get to the heart of just why it's worth the effort to go the yeah. extra mile with wonderful stewardship yeah it makes all the difference and and at the heart, you know, I've said it already and we said it in the other films we recorded, it is, and it's an old fashioned charity cliche, isn't it? You know, we just need to get ourselves out of the way. We need to simply connect donors with beneficiaries and the humanity just happens. The connection happens. Paul, thank you so much for making that lovely set of training films anyway for hospices and small charities. And thank you for this uh, podcast interview in, in which you've given some highlights and some new ideas as well i look forward to catching up with you very soon about whatever you're doing next in terms of fundraising to deal with 2021 best of luck to your team as they carry on handling those challenges but for now paul courtney thank you for joining me on the podcast and i will see you very soon well i hope you found this conversation helpful if so do remember to subscribe to the podcast today so that you never miss an episode. And as I mentioned earlier, if you found today's ideas helpful, then I promise you'll get lots more ideas and inspiration from the new training video series we've created, especially for hospices and small charities. It's called Hospice Fundraising Growth Strategies During and After the Pandemic. And in it, we have time to go into more depth on a bunch of things that hospices can do at the moment to help raise funds in spite of the pandemic. It includes more detail on corporate partnerships, on events, on leadership, and on how to create an energised, fundraising-friendly culture, and on individual giving. And it's completely free for any fundraiser to access whatever kind of charity you work for. So if you'd like to get hold of your copy, just go to the notes for episode 59, 
which is on the podcast section of my website. And my website is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. Go to those episode notes and click on the link. Just before I finish, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's been getting in touch and spreading the word about this podcast, both with colleagues and on social media. I really do appreciate it. Paul and I would love to hear what you think about this episode. We're both on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Paul is at Paul Kairos, which is spelt K-A-I-R-O-S, Paul Kairos. And I am at Woods underscore Rob. Finally, thank you so much for listening today and best of luck with your fundraising.